Welcome to episode 10, the final video of our App Builder Creation Tutorials first series. Please be sure to check out the other videos in the playlist if you haven't before, it's been quite a long journey already. The focus today is an exciting topic, I think, for any graphical builder, and that's actually editing the widgets and the layouts visible on screen. So wish me luck as we dive into our final episode for a while. Just before we get started though, you might want to look at some code I snuck in since our last video. I mentioned when we were implementing it that the add recent was a fairly naive implementation. It just appended or prepended recents to the list of what we'd already stored. But if you check out this new version, you'll see I inserted a little bit of code first. So first of all, we are going to list the recents that have been stored before. And when we are adding our own, we check to see if it's present. If it is, and if it's the top of the list, there's nothing to do, so we just return. If it's present, but it's further down the list, we bubble it up. We call this new ordering, the ordered recents, and we then write them and return. If neither of those things happened, then we basically run the code that we had before, where the list of recents is the new item with all of the previous ones, and we write those out. I think, I think that's everything that was added between times. Do, of course, remember that you can check out the code if you would like to at our GitHub repository. It's called Fission-Tutorials in the Fine Labs organization. But now let's get stuck into widget editing. You'll remember in the last video that I mentioned, or rather I added the ability to have multiple palettes for any editor. And that's where we're going to pick up today. If we go back to our graphical editor here, we are telling it that the palettes we have available are just this one item, this tab item, where the tab is called theme and the content is the result of make theme palette. Well, let's add another one there and we can include our widget editing as one of the tabs. So I add another container dot new tab item. We'll call this one widget and the widget um, info. It's a relatively straightforward tab. So I think we could just make it in line. I'll put um, that up here. So widget info, it's just going to be a form, widget.new form. And that will allow us to just list all of the properties of the widget or the layout that we're going to be editing. And I think for the moment, we'll just focus on editing or focusing on the right widget, um, making sure that we're editing the item and indicating which one is being edited. So we'll just start by saying what type of widget is that? So a new form item, uh, we'll just call this type, I suppose, and uh, widget type, I'll create a little label. Widget type is therefore a new label, widget.new label. And we currently have nothing selected at all. So um, select widget is probably a reasonable placeholder value. We need a comma after that. And that is probably all we need to have our new palette loaded. But there's probably not really enough there to show an exciting addition and weren't running the code. So why don't we look at just a little bit more? Let's, let's perhaps consider how we can choose a widget to be edited. Let's add a tap handler to the preview and that will um, allow us to do just a little bit more and to update what's on screen here. So our preview is being created here. We have a new inner window and the items that are being pushed into that uh, are the inner item, which is being created here, a new pad container with this object in it. And the object is just what we have decoded uh, from the JSON that's being loaded. So instead of um, just the object, let's put a new overlay on that 
that will allow us to intercept the tap so that we can make a selection. Um, let's just call that tapper. And this is going to need to be uh, a new type because we're going to be adding some behaviors. So uh, that might be a new widget selector um, over uh, that overlay object. And we're going to also want a callback mechanism. So that would say when our object has been selected, so that would be a find.canvas object. And we'll implement a little callback function here. To make what we're doing just now, probably want to move the code that we're working on just up a little. So when the new widget selector calls back, then we can say the widget type wants the text to be set to um, what the object's type is. Um, actually, so the graphical package, the GUI package that we used from before that allows us to understand widgets has a little um, feature there called name of, and we can pass it any canvas object. So that's going to tell us the name or the type of the widget. We can put, pass that into set text. And that's our callback function implemented for the very earliest version, just to update what's displayed. We can check that what we're tapping on is going to match um, what's being displayed. But this widget selector, that's going to take a bit of work. So let's create a new file for that type. Let's I'll just call it GUI selector, and that's going to have a new type. Well, package first, uh, editors, and then a type, which is widget selector as a struct. Um, and that's going to extend base widget, I expect. Uh, we'll have a constructor function, new widget selector. That was going to take the root canvas object. So that's the thing that we're um, operating on. And the callback function, um, which was going to also want a canvas object to be passed in when something has happened. And we'll return a widget selector object there. So we're obviously going to need to keep track of these things as well. So let's call that root for the canvas object and the callback can just be CB like I've called it before. Uh, canvas object, okay, that's great. So I think we can just return um, a constructed object here uh, where the root is object and the callback is callback. But anybody who's observant will notice actually this is a widget so we need to um, extend base widget before we return it. Um, return. Right. And that should be everything there except um, we don't implement all of the things necessary in widget. And that is primarily the uh, create renderer well, that's not going to be a problem at all. We can make a new function here on the widget selector type. Let's just call that W. Uh, called create renderer and return a canvas, uh, sorry, a widget renderer. Renderer. And we could do, um, well, let's use the simple renderer again which just allows us to pass any content at all that we want. But what is the content for this widget selector? Um, ideally, I suppose, when we tap an item on screen, we're going to want to indicate, uh, not just through the form that we've created, but by visually showing the surrounds of the widget that we're working with. So we want to put a rectangle on screen and also I suppose 
uh, yeah, m move it, highlight the object that needs to put it in a container so we can move the child around. Now this doesn't want to have a layout itself because we're going to be manually controlling it. So let's say container.new without layout because we are going to manage this ourselves and the object is going to be um, the, the highlight or overlay which hasn't been added yet so overlay is a canvas rectangle yeah rectangle probably the thing to be using here and let's just set that up when we construct the widget uh, yeah that's probably the easiest time so that's uh, canvas.new rectangle and uh, we don't want it to have a content color so let's just say color dot transparent for the center um, we would like it to have a, a, a stroke thickness so that we can display um, an outline of the objects that we're surrounding so a stroke width um, let's just guesstimate two and that's probably everything the stroke color is which is what's going to make it appear shouldn't be set yet um, because we're not actually highlighting a widget when we construct it so we'll come back to that and we're passing the overlay into our container here um, and that probably is enough to put the overlay and to have it sitting on top of the content and when it is ready to highlight something we can move that rectangle around and color it but first we're going to have to actually respond to the um, tapped event so we can do something when the user interacts so let's add that as well so uh, we'd, the widget selector wants to have a tapped method and of course if you've done this before a million times you don't need to know uh, won't need to be reminded but this needs a uh, point event to implement the tappable interface which is what gives this behavior it's um, what gives this behavior to the widget that we're creating so when our item is tapped what do we want to do well we're going to want to make our overlay visible so, so the stroke um, color is that uh, oh sorry w dot overlay dot stroke color there we go let's use the primary color from the theme just to really stand out the size and position well that's a very good point so which widget are we interacting with for now just to show that we have tapped let's work with the root widget so the position of our rectangle will be um, uh, probably zero zero but just to, uh, just to round it out perhaps um, the overlay dot move would go to the root position and then the size um, is going to be set to the root size and because we updated this here we may just want to uh, call refresh as well for good measure so we're faking the widget that we're using right now but that's probably good enough to demonstrate that things are working and let's complete the function by calling that function callback with the object that we selected which is the root perfect okay so that is going to update things it's going to move our overlay around inside the container without a layout so that those move and resize actions will actually be respected which of course they wouldn't be if we were using a layout in the container because the layout would take precedence and it would decide how things were going to be positioned on screen but in this case we're in control our user interface here is adding our um, widget selector which we call tapper 
above the object inside the inner of the inner window, the content there. So I think we're probably set up to give this a whirl. Let's go and run this version of the project. And it will show us recent projects. And I mentioned earlier the code had been updated. I've recently edited example and example three projects. So if I just tap example three, then next time we open it, we can see what has happened to the order of the items in our recent. So that didn't quite go to plan, did it? Okay, let's just go and scroll up and see what happened in our um, backlog here. Um, that's a little bit peculiar. Um, we're asking for the min size of a negative of a of a nil item in a container. Oh, the rectangle. We have a nil rectangle. Ah, yes, of course. So um, we created an overlay, which is excellent, but forgot to set it in the type. Um, and so what happened in our um, create renderer? was that we passed nil into our container. And as you can see, that's never going to be happy. An object that's missing is missing. An object that's hidden is not visible, but an object that is added but is nil, we can't ask it how big it should be. But there you go. You could see example three was moved to the top because we selected it. So there we go. Let's try that again. Example three and button are here. We have our widget palette with this new item called type um, that is asking us to select a widget. So let's do as it asks. We'll tap here and you can see, okay, so the position isn't quite right, but it has in fact tapped the root area and it's called back to update with the value container. So we have the name of the item that we're interacting with, that's a container, and that sounds about right to me. So let's look at the offset here. We have clearly um, moved down diagonally uh, and to the right by about the padding amount. So I suspect um, that will be because of the interaction between container and the um, root of the view. So let's just have a look at the construction here. Um, the object there tapper here, well, they're set up to be the same. Um, so I, it, it could be a small alignment issue, the position. Hmm, I can't see exactly why, but let's just take that out of here and see if positioning it in the stack directly over the background and the, the padded object actually fixes the alignment. Recent project, example three, and uh, we tap the UI. And there we go. So it's now centered appropriately. You can see it's just got the button bounds and the label bounds. But of course, it's only telling us about the container. That's not going to be hugely helpful because really we want to talk about a label and a button to be able to edit their properties. So let's go and have a look uh, what we can do about that. Clearly, our tapped callback is a little bit too naive. That's probably not a surprise. We did hard code it in here. So how would we go about working on this? Well, uh, I suppose what we need to do is understand where the mouse was clicked, get the relative position, actually, which is passed in in the point event. But then we're going to have to walk down the tree of widgets in our user interface and understand which one was underneath the mouse um, tap when we um, interacted. So we're going to try and drill down. Because of the way the UI is built, it's the um, lower items behind. What we're going to want to try and find is the furthest down the tree, I suppose, the object graph. So we'll look for items that are containing a mouse position and 
continue going down the relationships until something, uh, well, until we reach the bottom of the tree or until it's outside of the bounds. So uh, if the mouse was over here and we had four items, we might have a row, it's still in the row. We might have two columns, it's not in this one, it's in this one. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. So what we'll do, uh, first of all, I suppose, is to understand um, the position. So it's actually, I think the, the point event, because we are just working on an overlay, our point event is going to be uh, quite simple to understand because it's relative to the top left of the preview panel. So that should be quite straightforward. Let's see how that, let's see how that goes. Um, so we're going to want to set up some helper functions here. Uh, let's create a simple one called find child. Um, and so we're going to want to find the child of our root object. Um, and the position inside the root is ev.position. And then found is the name of the widget, I suppose. And hopefully that is going to always return something. But let's just say um, if it didn't, if found is nil for some reason, um, then we can use the uh, root again, like we have done. So any click event that's not recognized um, is going to just use uh, the container. Uh, so if it falls between widgets, for example, uh, or outside the maths area, hmm? I don't know, it seems like a good idea to have a fallback. Uh, so we'll make this function, uh, find child, and that takes uh, an object, uh, as many have done before, and a position, uh, position, and returns a canvas object, no bother at all. So what do we want to do here? Uh, when we're traversing through a tree of widgets, uh, ultimately what we want to do is find a widget. Uh, I don't think we're going to be working with canvas objects, the text and the lines and the rectangles inside a widget, not for basic property manipulation that we're aiming for here. So we need to iterate through uh, containers, which can contain a widget, but also the um, child nodes of a the ch children elements of a widget. Rich text is a widget inside a button. Let's not let's not cascade down into widgets and sub widgets because the behavior is on the widget itself. Yes. Let's just okay. So we'll just look at whether a container matches, uh, and if that's the case, we will tra traverse the children, and if not, then we'll step out. So we want to know if the object being passed in is a container. Um, I think the easiest way to do that is with a type check. So we do a switch statement with the type there and in the case that it is a container, then we can execute some pretty Swiss code to iterate through all of the items inside the container. Uh, so that would be all of the potential widgets inside the range of container objects. So for each widget, is it where our mouse is positioned? So if, um, let's, I suppose let's take the elimination. So if it's not inside, we don't need to go any further because child objects of a container will always be inside the container. So if it's not inside um, the position is not inside this widget, then we can continue hoping that another one inside the container does match. So now we have a point that's inside the container, um, inside this potential widget, but this widget could be anything. Um, we need to make sure that it's not um, further down. So we need to recurse. So if this potential child um, we call back into ourselves. So for the widget that we're looking at now, is there a sub widget, a child of that? So 
we pass ourselves this well we pass sorry the child that we're working with now and we take away the uh, position the top left of this new widget from the position that we're looking at so if um, if our point is here from the top left and the widget top corner is here we want to investigate based on that small distance there which is what we're just calculating here so now if the um, oh I'm sorry that should be position not P. If the child is not nil, then um, return child. And then that means, so we've checked if it's not matching the child, and now we're checking if there was a, a sub element. If not, then we are a widget or potentially a container that the mouse is inside that doesn't have any valid children that the mouse is inside. So we could probably return ourself at that point, or the, the child object at this point. Um, yes, because we're definitely inside having checked that um, we're not not inside. Now, if it was that the type didn't match um, then we're going to want to return nil so that this nil check here when we're iterating, uh, sorry, recursing is going to trigger. So the only thing left there is are we um, inside the object? So we just need to do that um, essentially hit check. So we create a new function called inside and that's going to take a object. It could operate on any object and a position and that'll be a relative position to the top left of the object that we're aiming to check. So we want to know, is the pointer between the top left corner and the bottom right corner? So top left is P, um, sorry, the position of the object. If our point X is left of the top left, then it's no good or if the um, p dot y is l above the top, so that's the top left dot y, no good, return false. Then we need to figure out what the size is, so that's um, object size, and so now we're going to look at is um, our point to the top left of the position plus the size, we can just I actually return based on this piece of Boolean logic. So um, return if the p dot x is less than um, top left x plus size dot width. And if the y position is less than top left y plus of um, the size dot height. Uh, I forgot we need to return true uh, boolean here. So we are returning false if that's not true, and then we're returning the result of are we inside that bottom corner. So that should be the hit check correct. Um, and what are we doing here? The value of root found is never used. Ah, yeah, well, we have determined which object we want to operate on, but we're still ignoring it. So now we should be able to use found instead of the root of our um, tappable widget uh, overlay. The widget selector, <laughs> forgot what I called it, sorry. And then call back on it. So in theory, that should be functioning correctly. Let's, let's have a quick look at that and see how it's going. So again, recent project three um, and tap on the label. Oh, well, it's found the label and it knows it's a label and it's found the button as well. Okay, excellent. But our assumption about positioning is out the window. <laughs> We've gone back up um, the wrong way. So let me just correct that. The idea of moving it out just because, clearly, a bit of an assumption. It needs to be in the same padded. And that makes sense because now the coordinate, um, the top left position is aligned because they're positioned in the same padded container. So we probably need a special case for uh, if this is the root. 
so the position would be found dot position the size found dot size but if found is w dot root then the position is position dot subtract uh, theme dot oh well new new square so, um, new square offset position theme dot padding and the size will therefore be added to by a new size a new square size theme dot padding um, times two so we're adding it a bit that way and two bits to compensate um, and then we use position here and size here oh. Oh, I love an IDE that can point out where I have forgotten something important. Recent projects, example three, and we tap on the contain uh, the label. Label's aligned, button is aligned, and if we tap the space between the two, oh, the size looks good, but the position is still not quite right. It is the container. The individual widgets are correct. Adding um, move position. Um, Interesting. I wonder what's happening there. The size looks about right, but the position not so much. Um, well, we know it's the root, so perhaps what we need to say is that the position is a negative position, and just just say that. Um, let's see how that goes. Uh, we go to the root, tap the container. Yeah, okay, that looks good. There's obviously a bit of padding there, but that makes sense. So if we tap outside, but inside the window border, we want to get the background container so that works for me and the widget is label the widget is button the widget is a container okay well that's pretty good next what we want to do is look at the widget properties for the type that we have selected so we need to um, bring in a little bit of smarts from the GUI library that we were using we've already called it here to get the name of an object now I happen to know there's a really helpful um, function there that will actually provide us an editor which is uh, going to allow us all of the properties. So it, uh, it takes the object in, that's the item that we've tapped. It takes a map of properties that is for any um, extra items that aren't part of the, the widget itself. I think we can ignore that for now. It was it came up in an earlier video and we just ignored it then hopefully we could do that again um, anyhow the result is a list of form items well that's pretty handy isn't it because we're working with a form already so the items is returned the editor takes in the object and um, hopefully we can pass in a nil map uh, although remembering the problem that we had last time uh, let's just not pass in a nil map we'll give it a populated or rather sorry an existing but empty map and that takes a map of maps so that's properties per yeah a map of properties for each canvas object um, Sorry, it's not a map of all of the properties of all of the widgets. It's a map of properties specific to this widget. But that is the list of items returned. So now we can 
um, tell our form that we would like it to add these items. Um, so our widget info items could append, um, but actually we have, I mean, if we just append, going to get longer and longer. What we want is this uh, one item at the top, so widget info dot items, including the first one, and then we'll append it. So um, append that, um, everything else to that. That would be all of the widgets, and then widget info dot refreshed, pick up the new items that we have added. Um, okay, so that's the editor for the item that, that we've selected. That um, was straightforward as well. Let's see how the library is helping us with our widget editing. So we go to the widget panel here and we choose our label. And it has added a little thing here, which is a text field which, yeah, maps to the public field of our label called text, and we can edit that. And it is updating in line. Oh, that's quite exciting. Uh, let's, have, let's have a look at our button. The button has three fields, so we can... Uh, oh, okay. The text isn't updating, but let's see. Can we have a cancel icon? Yeah, we can have a cancel icon on our button and we could change the importance level perhaps. Yeah, so we have a, a success or a danger um, button underneath our label, but the text field isn't updating. Uh, that's peculiar. I think we may have, we may have just hit a caching bug here, unfortunately. Um, so let's... Uh, we're doing two operations in one. Um, so let's say widget info dot items equals the first item only, and then refresh it. Um, if there is some smarts going on with the caching, then that will uh, empty it, hopefully. All of the items that came after that we were replacing, it may just not noticed somehow. Um, so we'll refresh with only one item and then we'll append the new items to the old singular item. Um, and that should help, I think. That's welcome. Uh, oh, I forgot our edit. We'll come back to that. Um, our button there is now called a button. So we could therefore say uh, log in and um, with a login button, you probably want a, a computer icon or something like that. Um, and yeah, that's probably uh, oh, high importance for a primary button. Uh, I think it's fine at medium. Wow, that's okay. That's cool for our two widgets. Now I said that we were going to look at container layouts as well. So here we have our container um, and we could uh, use a different layout. So if we had a horizontal box, that is that's working correctly. It's laid them out horizontally. Um, the window is stretched, of course. That was the previous height. It needed to be wider, and we can't we can't seem to resize that there. So let's come back to that um, and pop to our container again. Um, we could do something bizarre, like I could do a stack layout and one will appear over the other. And there you go. That uh, <laughs> very unhelpfully uh, put our login button directly over the other widget. Um, but there's other, what well, we could do a, a grid. Um, yeah, a grid with, uh, oh, it's just defaulting to two columns probably some work to do there. Um, and maximum, oh, that's the old name for stack. Let's just put it back to vertical box. But we, we probably want to be able to resize this window, I suppose, and, and then we can see how the layout works. Let's go and have a quick look at that. So we've used inner window here, 
and in a window itself it's just a widget. Uh, it makes it look like a window and it's up to us to appropriately position it on the, on the um, screen, size it and, and add any functionality. All we have done is set the close intercept essentially to non-op, no-op, a, a non-operation so that it won't close. But we do want it to be able to resize. So where we are using our window here, we're putting it into a center layout. And I mean, that's it's pretty helpful, I suppose, but it's not allowing us to move it around. So let's um, pop this over here. Um, new center, and instead of that, what we really want is a, um, uh, let me think, a can, um, new multi-window, new multiple window. And so this is going to take a number of inner windows and then that will actually be able to operate as you would expect, you know, as a window to, to move and drag it around. That's what the multiple windows is going to do for us. Um, oh, I've, I've reused a variable name there, haven't I? Uh, so multi, that should be fine. It's not used until we put it there. Um, the position is probably uh, not going to be right, but that's that's okay. Um, we're testing, can it be moved around? So there we go, we have our resize, we have the ability to move the window, and it's going to fit inside this space. But now if we go and edit the container, oh, <laughs> in dark mode, of course I'm going to do that, uh, as a grid, then you can see that as the items expand and move around, it is able to show how the layout will work. It would appear that our preview, um, our highlight isn't uh, updating, which I suppose makes sense um, because we've just captured where the widget is and then we don't move it at all. So let's fix that as well. This would be in our selector. When we tap, we set the, the position uh, and that's great. We're asking what has been found and then moving it and resizing it appropriately. But what we're going to have to do um, is remember what is selected so that if we resize, we can get that information again. Uh, yeah, um, and then that will um, be able to be updated. So root and chosen, uh, I suppose. Chosen will be this variable found. Uh, we just want an equals there. And so that item move resize code probably needs to be factored out to be reused. Um, let's do just that. So uh, update uh, 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 overlay. Then we'll make that method here. Thunk widget selector update overlay pass that in there. The item that we're going to be updating for is what was chosen. Yeah, that, that's been set. Um, and we can, yeah, that's, that's going to be fine there. Then we just need to respond to the resize. Let's put that in here. Now this mm, hopefully is going to be okay, but what we're wanting to do is just to call update overlay with the new size. Uh, so that's should be passing in there, I think. 
we're overriding the resize of base widget here. Um, and so if we just leave it like that, the widget is not actually going to execute anything to do with its internal sizing. So before we update our rendering, we need to call um, resize on the base widget. And this is something that you'll need to do if you're extending a base widget or any other widget and you want to add um, add behavior on top of what already exists rather than replacing it like this would call onto the base widget here but whatever you've extended and then call your functionality or in the other order if you if you need to but remember to call that old method first or second but do call it mm. so let's just see how that oh I've missed something important yes of course resize is going to be called before we have actually set up our overlay. So if that is um, nil, then just return nothing, nothing to do, or at least nothing sensible, I don't think. So we can just forget about that, move on, and um, let's resize that there. First of all, get our drag handle. That's the label. Ah, and there we go. We've got our resizing working and the tap outside of any known widget is the container. And we can update our layout. Let's make that uh, um, horizontal box. And this is actually pretty helpful to see how a horizontal box is working. This is much bigger because it's the minimum width for the two items. And so if um, we made the text a little, um, smaller again, then obviously it is much less space taken up. And quite nicely, the code that we put in to handle resizing is executing here as well, because the item is resizing in response to its minimum size getting smaller because the container is compressing to its minimum size. So we get some freebies in there, which is excellent. And that is our preview window resizing. Congratulations. Now, the last thing I think that we should cover is you will notice, of course, that every time I go back to this example, it the what we had, um, the template, nothing has saved. You can see here, we go to recent, open this, and it's exactly the same again. So let's see if we can't just wrap this up by actually saving the widget state back into the file that we loaded from. So to do the save, we'll go back to where it um, is loaded, I suppose. And that is our GUI file. Um, if we scroll down through here, there's some suitable load code, which is using the same, um, the, the same library, I, I think, that we have earlier. Um, oh goodness, where is that function? I've lost, oh, of course, sorry, it's all the way up here. We're just, um, calling this reader and decoding the JSON from it. So essentially we just need to do the opposite and we will hook the save in through our simple editor. The simple editor here, as we saw a few episodes ago, having a save function so that we can have our editors provide um, information about what to do when we're saving. Uh, so our save is going to want to save it back to the URI we had before. This save function takes no parameters, I think. Yeah, but it can return an error. So our, um, let's put it just next to the load for now. So the save is a new func that takes no parameters, returns an error, and is implemented like so. Um, Save, declared, but not used. Uh, ah, yeah, sorry. So we pass the save function into the uh, save field here. And implementing this is going to um, take the object, push it into the um, a writer to the original URI. So we're going to want to open a writer, which may error to the same URI, uh, that's as above there. 
if the error is not equal to nil, return the error. Yep. Um, now, assuming that it is good, we're going to want to defer w.close. Did we, uh, did we forget to close the reader up here? Oh, that's terribly naughty. So let's defer closing the writer. And now for our next potential error, <laughs> we will um, GUI.encode the JSON. And that is going to take the object, um, the mapping, which I mentioned earlier, the properties, which is some metadata for a map, sorry, a string string, for all possible objects and the writer. So we know the object, that's what we've been operating on. We know the writer, that's what we just opened. And the map, let's just pass it an empty map. Map, that's a map of canvas object to map of string to string, just in case it really wouldn't like nil. And then if there was no, uh, if there was an error, if, uh, or we could just return the error uh, because at this point we're done. In fact, we could just return that value. So we have encoded the JSON back to its original file. That looks pretty solid. Error handling is going to be done elsewhere, which we coded up many weeks ago. And as long as our save function is hooked in and returns errors, then that should be all of the handling that we need. So we'll open our recent project one more time. We'll go to this. We'll call it welcome, uh, welcome edited. And our button, let's, let's put that computer icon there. I quite like that. And tap me. Okay, so um, let's therefore save that, um, which was up here, the save menu, in case you didn't notice. I guess I'll just close it and, um, and hope that the function hooks through. And there we go. Welcome edited. Tap me with a computer icon. We have successfully edited our user interface. Um, just to fully check it, I suppose, we could update the layout on our widget. Let's just uh, say a grid layout, save that and exit again. Don't worry about the, the random debugging going in the output. I think the library that we're using is probably in development at the moment. And there we have a grid layout, a widget there, a button there, um, and responding with an exact size, um, equal size for each of the items. Well, there we go. That's pretty exciting. Um, and it's going to work in light mode and dark mode. Excellent. Well, whew, there you go. I hope you feel that's quite a satisfying result. I'm very happy with where we've got to. It has been, I think, a busy 10 weeks, but we've made it through. The first version of our app builder is functional. There's clearly a lot more to do, but uh, hopefully you're also quite happy with what we've been able to pull together. We've demonstrated what's possible, how to do some things, and even the bones of how this product is coming together I hope it's inspired you a little bit. We will be back in future videos. I don't have a particular timescale for it yet, but be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll get updates whenever we are posting them. And don't forget to head along to fission.app and see what the latest is on this project. We'll be updating that even more often without tutorials and other things like FineConf keeping us super busy between times. So do check that out. Thanks for being here with us on this project. I hope that you've really enjoyed it and that you will come back again to see us in a future series. Bye.